Sa dunya, the world you are building. Okay. Well, as you see, I entitled my presentation Black Stories 101. Now, the reason I called it Black Stories instead of history is that I have the feeling that history, traditionally, history has been his story. And that has been the story of mainstream men, so mainly the stories of white men. There, there have been a few ladies thrown into the mix, but basically it's all about the white man and what they did. So I called it Black Stories because here I wish to tell a bit about the history of black people in Canada, which is not widely known. As this lady said, she did know a bit about the Underground Railroad. And traditionally, most people think that black people came to Canada via the Underground Railroad, which I will come to later. But I'd like to put it in perspective and in chronological order. So, um, as uh, Madeline said, la this month is called Black History Month. And the reason we have this month set aside is because it's a chance for black people to tell their story. Now, Black History Month is meant for all people. You know, our Prime Minister, Mr. Stephen Harper, said Canadians should learn their history. I couldn't agree with him more. And so what we attempt to do during this month is tell the story of Canadians. Another misconception is many people feel that uh, black people only came to Canada during the Underground Railroad, what, which was in the 1800s, roughly from 1815 to 1860. But the truth is, black people were here in this country as, at the same time as the French and the British. Why celebrate Black History Month? Well, to make the Canadian community at large aware of the part played by blacks and all early pioneers in the building of this great nation. That's one reason. The next reason? It also affirms, empowers, and provides role models to our black youth as they learn of the many contributions of blacks. Now that picture there is the picture of the lady whom I'm referring to, Rosemary Sedlier. She's, she's the president of the Ontario Black History Society. And she says, students learn of social forces which have shaped and influenced their community and identities as a means of feeling connected to the educational experience. You know, the, the rule has been, when you, here in Kingston, as you can see, there aren't that many people of color. So when, you're, when you go to school, like the schools at which I have taught, I am usually the only black teacher on that staff. When my children have gone to school here, they were often the only black child in a class of 30. Sometimes there would be a second. So, you know, you have to wonder, how did that child feel when they were um, the only child? And when they were learning their history, they were only learning about what white people had done. So, therefore, that goes to show it's very important that when they're in that class, they also learn that their forefathers played a part in the building of this nation as well. <clears throat> I, that's the same thing I told you. History has been, traditionally, history has been his story. Now it is a time to tell of the black loyalists, blacks who fought in the War of 1812, blacks who worked side by side with whites, First Nation folk, and others. This is where the Asians would come in. And uh, they helped to build homes and prepare for the harsh winters. At another time when I have researched further, I will tell her story 
the story of the many women who did things. Now, this is the first free black man who arrived in Canada, and his name is Matthew da Costa. He arrived in Canada in 1605. And he came here with Samuel de Champlain. When you learn about Canadian history, you will hear a lot about Samuel de Champlain. But Samuel de Champlain would not have been able to converse with the Mi'kmaq Indians had it not been for this man. This man, Matthew de Costa, was his translator. Now, Matthew de Costa was born in the Azores, but he was a man who did trading. He, he went uh, a lot of exploring, and he went down the coast of Africa, the West Coast. And so he could speak at least five languages, one of them, as I said, being the Mi'kmaq. And so that's why he was able to translate for Samuel de Champlain. Now, in 1619, you had the first shipload of African slaves to reach North America. They landed at Jamestown. When you see that, it's not all that clear, but you could see what the conditions were like on those slave ships. <coughs> they were just overcrowded. And if any of you saw this um, Book of Negroes program that they've been having on the CBC for the last six weeks, you can see some of the conditions and some of the things that those people had to endure. I mean, the ships were just overcrowded, so overcrowded, many of the people died. And then, if they did not listen to their slave masters, I mean, when I watched the Book of Negroes, it was so cruel, I couldn't watch it all. They would throw some of them overboard while they were still alive. And then, when they got to uh, their, their places in North America, and they were sold, like they were just treated like pieces of furniture. So they were sold to people, and when people got their slaves, they very often would brand them. Do you remember you see pictures of animals where they put that hot iron on them, take it out of the hot fire, and put the marking on it so they would know that that was their animals? They did that to these people, some of them. And so they were just treated unbelievable. In 1628, the story of uh, Canada has a lot to do with slaves being brought to this country. But this was not known for a long, long time. Most people felt in Canada would tell you that the first slaves came here via the Underground Railroad. But we've had people who have dug into history. And I have only found out about this in the last two years myself. The very first named slave of African descent in Canada was a six-year-old boy. He was the property of Sir David Kirk. The child was sold several times, and lastly, to Father Paul Lejeune, who was, the boy was baptized Catholic and named Olivier Lejeune. Olivier was the name of the clerk who registered him. And Lejeune, as you can see, was the name of the Jesuit priest who took him on. And, and thank goodness he wasn't sold anymore after that. And I hope he had a good life with him. Because the people appealed to him and said to the king, we can't do all this work ourselves. We need help. And so can we have slaves? And King Louis XIV gave them permission to have slaves. Now, we move on to the 1700s. Now, this story is quite a sad story. Uh, this is the story of Marie Joseph Angelique. During the night of April the 10th in 1734, Montreal burned. Marie Joseph Angelique a 29-year-old slave was arrested, tried, and found guilty of starting the blaze that consumed 46 buildings, including the Hotel du Convent. A convent is a place where you know of nuns 
So th th it was a, well, this was a home for nuns. And so it burned down 46 buildings, including the convent. So for this, she was condemned to death. But of course, they had to try her. Some, some reports say that she had tried to escape from her mistress so that she could go with her lover. And that's why she burnt down the buildings. Anyway, they took her to court and they tried her. Now, while she was in court, they did so many severe questions of her. And I, I don't quite understand this full story myself. But part of the story that I read said that they also did <coughs> a hideous torture to her that shattered the bones in her legs. And she, they tortured her so much that she confessed. And she said, yes, yes, I did start the fire. But up until this day, we don't know. You can imagine if someone's torturing you and so far as to break your legs, you're going to say yes too, probably. Some wouldn't. But you're going to say yes because you wanted to stop. So what they did, only under that pr pressure of the question, did she confess? She was executed by hanging. And she was first paraded through the streets as an object lesson to blacks. She was then hung and strangled. And her body was burned. Now, this story was told, and, and the person uh, who got her degree in um, history of slavery here in Canada took 15 years to work on this story and come up with that. It was, she's one of the experts on slavery and black history here in Canada. Her name is Dr. Afwa Cooper. She was born in Jamaica, but she's now a Canadian uh, historian. And she did 15 years of research to come up with this story of Mary Joseph Angeli. 1776, some free Negroes reached Nova Scotia. Some were black loyalists. You know, we often hear of the loyalists, and most of us think of the loyalists as being white men. But there were black loyalists. And they got their name loyalists because they, uh, during the um, wars in the States, um, Britain had these people, asked them to come and fight for them, and they would give them land and give them their freedom. And so that's why some of the black loyalists came to Canada on the promise that they would get that from Britain. But you know, as you will find out, they did not always keep their word. They did not keep their word. That, so blacks were encouraged to desert rebel masters. The British commander in chief guaranteed all slaves who formally requested British protection would be freed. 100,000 blacks fled to the British <coughs> during the American Revolution. Now, right here in Kingston, there was a minister, head of the Church of England. So you see that beautiful um, church there, which is called the Cathedral. We have two cathedrals here in Kingston, just St. George Cathedral and St. Mary's Cathedral. St. Mary's Cathedral is Roman Catholic. The St. George Cathedral is Anglican or Protestant. And the head of that church back in 1781, Reverend John Stewart, recorded in his journal that he brought black slaves with him from the Mohawk Valley. So did Molly Brandt. Now, in 1784, you have Canada's <coughs> first race riot down in Nova Scotia. There was a race riot there because at this time, jobs were very limited. And blacks were doing the low-down jobs. But then, many of the whites came, and they didn't have jobs. So they even wanted to push blacks out of those low-paying jobs so that they would have jobs. So this wouldn't sit well with any group. So that's why we had this first race riot. And then the people in command didn't want, they were called, you know, blacks have had many names down through the years. This time, they're being called Negroes. 
Well, in 1785, the powers that be said, Negroes <laughs> frolics prohibited. That means they weren't allowed to dance, they weren't allowed to gather, because they thought it might cause another riot. So therefore, they made a law that Negroes weren't allowed to act out, to get together. In 1787, the new United States passed its first anti-slavery law. And in 92, you find there was a black loyalist exodus. The people were having difficulty in supporting themselves through discrimination and uh, due to discrimination. So you have almost 1,200 blacks. They left Halifax and went to Sierra Leone. That's another place in Africa. Sierra Leone, Africa. Now, here's a gentleman from Canada, John Simcoe. In 1793, March of that year, Chloe Cooley, a black slave girl, was beaten and bound by her owner and sold to an American. This gentleman here, he was a governor down in near the London area. How is that where Simcoe County is? In that, area. in that area, anyway. Well, this gentleman was the governor general down there, and he was very upset at what he saw happening to this slave girl. And he, he was convinced that the abolition of slavery was necessary. Abolition meaning he felt there should be no more slavery. So he eventually, I think the year later, he got a law passed, you know, that same year, Anti-slavery bill was introduced. It passed, but not a total ban on slavery, but a gradual prohibition. You know, that happens in our country today. You might have a law, but it doesn't be, and it's passed, but it doesn't, it takes time for it to come into effect. And that's what happened there. It took a while. And black loyalists petitioned for an all black settlement in Upper Canada. They wanted to be to themselves, but the idea was rejected. <clears throat> now, in 1796, you had 600 freedom fighters arrive in Halifax from Jamaica. These immigrants were called Maroons, and they were escaped slaves who had guarded their freedom for more than a century and had fought off countless attempts to re-enslave them. These guys had been slaves in Jamaica. But they did not like it, and so they escaped, and they went up into the hills of Jamaica. And they stayed up there for years, just so that they would not be captured and made slaves again. And so then, when they got the chance, they left Jamaica and went to Halifax. So that explains like why in Halifax you find a large black population. Many more people there than you would find in well, I don't know about the other areas now, but at least then. And this is how they used to advertise slaves, like, like I say, like a piece of furniture. In 1806, Elizabeth Russell complains about the behavior of her slave, Peggy, and Peggy's son, Jupiter. Oh, Peggy's son was named Jupiter. And she ran an ad in the Upper Canadian Press, ready to sell Peggy for $150 and Jupiter for $200. That was pretty expensive in those days, back in the 1800s. So you had to be quite rich and able to afford to buy a slave. Now, here's your part, the Underground Railroad. Like I said, this took place between 1815 to 1860. Now, the Underground Railroad what you need to understand is that the Underground Railroad was really not a railroad. There were no railroads in existence at that time. But what the people did, they used the language of railroads in order to, because when they were running away from their masters, they had to use a code to get away. And so they would, like, there were people who were conductors. The conductor simply meant the person who led them and showed them the way. And one of two of the most famous people are Harriet Tubman, who is said to have led 300 people, slaves, into Canada. And another one is the name William, 
William. I'm thinking William Tell. I know it's not William Tell. <laughs> anyway, this guy, William, he led over 800. And he kept beautiful notes for everyone whom he helped to escape this way. So now what they had to do in the Underground Railroad, in order to get away, they, they used um, uh, quilts, people say. You know those beautiful things you put on your bed? And they have beautiful designs. I bought some of the designs here. For example, on those quilts, they would have had a design like this. Flying geese. And the geese, when they saw the sign, they said that the people used to just hang the quilt over a fence or somewhere like that. And that would be a sign as to where the people were to go. So if they saw this sign of the geese, it meant follow the geese. Because you see, they wouldn't have tried to escape in the winter. Because in the winter, they would have found very harsh conditions. So when the geese were flying north, they knew to follow the geese because then the weather was getting nicer. This right here is a monkey wrench pattern. That was a sign right up here, monkey wrench. That was a sign for them to be sure and take tools with them. They would need tools to build houses. They might need tools to build off, to, to ward off some of the um, terrible animals that they would encounter. So take those things with them. Here is a wagon wheel. That meant that a, a wagon cart would be coming by. So they used things like that. They sang, I don't know if you've heard of um, songs called Negro Spirituals. They, had, they used to sing songs, but when they were singing their songs, they were really giving signals to the others. So they communicated by quilts, railroad lingo, and they sang spirituals. For example, one of the um, spirituals, you know that one, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming forth to carry me home. Now, Jordan is from the Bible, the Jordan River. But for the uh, slaves who were trying to escape, Jordan River meant the Detroit River. And when they say, I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming forth to carry me home. They meant the slave masters were after them. So get moving. And so, you know, so very often they would go through the river because when, and, and the slave masters came after them and they had those dogs that would sniff them out, you know, mm -hmm. to help to show them where they were. So if they went in the water, the dogs would lose the trail. They would lose the scent. So that's one thing that they would do. Oh, that guy's name was William Still. <laughs> and you see, they used um, railroad language. They would say, that the train is, is leaving at, uh, at midnight. And the train is traveling from midnight to dawn. Midnight was a code word for Detroit. That meant that that's where the next group of people were going to meet. So those who were going had to go to Detroit. And they were traveling from midnight to dawn. Detroit was midnight and dawn was Canada. So that's how they used it. Now, another thing I found out that they did, you know, of course they had babies. So the babies, if they cried, could alert the, the, the people where they were. So they used drugs. You know, lots of our native people, lots of people back in our countries, they know what um, plants to get, what effect they're going to have. So I'm sure it wasn't marijuana they were using, but it was some plant. And they would feed this to the babies so the babies wouldn't cry. And um, what's another interesting thing I found out about it? They always traveled on Saturdays because the, the notes wouldn't go out into the newspaper until the Monday. And so therefore, when they left on Saturday, it gave them a two-day head start before they were reported missing. So I thought these folks were pretty smart. 
Now, I, I did prepare a special little story about <clears throat> the lady Harriet Tubman, whom I told you was one of the main conductors, people who led them through. Harriet Tubman, Tubman was born in 1820 in Maryland. She was an African-American abolitionist. That means she was trying to get rid of slavery. She was born a slave herself, but she rescued more than 300 slaves through the Underground Railroad. Now, in her life, she was beaten by masters, but she escaped in 1849. But she returned many times to rescue both family members and non-relatives. She was known as Moses because Moses in the Bible led people to the promised land. So they saw her and they nicknamed her Moses. Early in Harriet's life, she suffered many hardships and physical violence. The violence she suffered caused permanent physical injuries. She told the story of how one day she was lashed five times before breakfast. If you've seen any of those movies, 12 Years a Slave, The Book of Negroes, those lashes weren't little petty slaps. They were hard. And so much so that she carried the scars for the rest of her life. Her most severe injury occurred when she was an adolescent. She was sent to a dry goods store. There she met a slave who had left the field where he had, was working without permission. The man's overseer demanded that Harriet help restrain this guy, help me catch him, but Harriet refused. So the overseer, he threw a two pound weight which caught her right in the head. And this led to her suffering seizures, severe headaches, and narcoleptic episodes for the rest of her life. A narcoleptic episode, I might be talking to you now, but all of a sudden you fall right off to sleep, right in the middle of my speaking to you. So she, she suffered them for the rest of her life. Now in 1833, finally, the British Parliament abolishes slavery. So many, in many countries, in my home country, we uh, recognize that day, it's a holiday, because that's when they gave up on slavery. Now, just to tell you a few things about, well, this guy, Josiah Henson, escapes to Canada. He did a lot for slaves down in the London area. One of the contributions of a black, which you, you very seldom hear about, but back here in Canada, in 1845, there was the birth of a man named John Ware. He was an African-American cowboy, but he's remembered for his ability to ride and train horses. And he brought the first cattle to southern Alberta in 1882, helping to create that province's important ranching industry. So, you know, out in Calgary, you hear a lot about the stampede and all that, and it, it brings a lot of money into the country, especially out there. But in order to get that started, it was a black man who bought the first horses. They said that man could, the way, it, and he, I don't know that much about riding and all that, but apparently he could hook, he could ride a steer and he could, he was just the number one guy. Um, he, it is said that he popularized steer wrestling and it has become a highlight of the Calgary Stampede. Now, one other story before I get to that stamp up there is, do um, you know, you all know of Queen's University here. You've got children who attend there. Well, do you know, there was, a, there was a young man who went to Queen's, Robert Sutherland. He was the first black man to go to Queen's University. And he was a top student. He won many prizes there. But, and I think his, I forget what his degree was in, but when he graduated, he had mathematics and some other things. But anyway, he left Queens as a top student and he went to Osgood Hall. That's where they train lawyers. And he is also, as far as we know, the first black student to have gone to Osgood Hall. He did very well, graduated as a lawyer, and then he moved to Chatham and around London area 
that's where many of the people from the Underground Railroad had settled. And so he went there to help them and to do a lot of his law work. And I'm sure he became quite rich off of them. But unfortunately, he became quite sick as a young, at a young age. And he was hospitalized in Toronto. I think part of the story goes he had pneumonia. And he was in his mid-40s when this happened. Well, meanwhile, back home here in Kingston, Queens was having severe money problems. And the then principal, Mr. Grant, went to visit this guy, Robert Sutherland, in the hospital. And he explained to him what problems Queens was having. So this fellow, Robert Sutherland, said, well, I enjoyed my time at Queens. When I was at Queens, they always treated me as a gentleman. And on that alone, and he hadn't married, he had no children, so he left his entire fortune to Queens, and he died soon after that. And the money he left to Queens back in the 1850s was $12,000. It was enough to save Queens because Queens was on the verge of either having to join up with the University of Toronto or closing. So it took a black man to save Queens University. Now when I went to give this speech, we had invited the principal and I had to say it. Do you know, I said, we've got these black students at Queens, but they're not treated very nicely, some of them. Many of them feel alienated. 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 Yeah. They don't feel that good there. I was surprised to find this out. And um, anyway, the principal set up a meeting with me. I had to go and meet with him. Because I thought, it's no good in talking all this stuff and, and acting like everything is great, great, when it's not. If, you, if, you're, if you're not liking something, you've got to tell people sometimes, you know? So I did. However, that's my story of um, Robert Sutherland. And eventually, we had to fight a lot to get a building at Queens named after him. So in 2009, I think it was, the policy building was finally named in honor of uh, Robert Sutherland. But I say it's a shame nobody will ever, nobody can tell from that name that he's a black man. But, but there are no pictures of him around. No pictures. And another story of a, um, in, uh, a black guy here in um, Kingston back in the 18, middle 1800s was this fellow George Mink. He had come to Kingston as a slave of this man, John Herkimer. And I guess John Herkimer was a rather nice guy because eventually George Mink got his freedom. And he must have had a fierce sum of money because he was able to set up a stagecoach here in um, Kingston. And he initially, he, he was the mail carrier on his stagecoach. He took the mail from Kingston up to Coburg. And then eventually the trains did come in. And so the trains, they, they carried the mail by trains. So he's quite the entrepreneur. So he then set up a thing whereby he um, carried the people on his stagecoach from the train station to downtown Kingston. And he, uh, he set up quite a few things within this town. Now after him, let's move along. So some of the other positive things, well, this is the story of Viola Desmond. How many of you have heard the story of Rosa Parks? You haven't heard, heard of Rosa Parks either. Well, Rosa Parks was a lady down in the States whom all, people always compliment about her because she was a person who blacks had to, when they got on a bus or on a train, they had to sit in the back on a bus. And, the, and she sat in a front seat and they wanted her to move to the back, but she wouldn't move. And so that's a big story in the States and here in Canada. But we have our own story right here in Canada. This lady, Viola Desmond, her incident happened about nine years before Rosa Parks. Now this lady lived in Halifax, but look at her hairstyle. She was a beautician. And she uh, had a beauty school down in Halifax. So she had to travel to another city in, uh, in Nova Scotia in order to get goods for her beauty parlor. So when she traveled um, this one day in her car, her car broke down in this place called New Glasgow. 
So she took the car, well, somebody from the station came, checked out her car, and said, oh, this car needs a lot of work. So you're going to have to leave it with us overnight. So therefore, she thought, well, she's got a lot of time on her hands. So while waiting, she thought she would go to the movie theater. So she went to the movie theater, bought her ticket, but she went and sat in a seat downstairs. Now, the seats downstairs were for whites only. So she didn't really know that. So they came to her, the head of the theater, and said, sorry, lady, you're not allowed to sit here. And she said, well, I'm quite comfortable here. And so they said, well, you didn't pay enough money to sit here. You got to pay an extra cent in order to sit down here. So I don't know. Let's say she offered to pay the extra cent. I don't know this part. I'm making this up. Anyway, what I do know for sure, they then tried to escort her. And she wouldn't move. She wouldn't leave. So they called for the police. And the police came, and they took her out. They must have been a bit harsh, because they, the story goes that she hurt her knee. So it sounds to me like they used some force in getting her out. And she had to spend the night in prison. But this lady was like one of these people. You know those people back home who are just perfect? <laughs> I'd be one of those. So it is said that she sat up all night in the prison with her white gloves on, and she wasn't going to lie down in any prison. So the next morning, they took her out, and they took her to court. And, and the charge was she sat in the section without paying the extra money. And so I don't know what happened after that, but she, but she didn't spend any more nights in the prison. But in the years to come, people in Nova Scotia are realizing that what they did was wrong. And so she died before she got an apology. But the apology was given. Her sister is still alive today. But the um, Nova Scotia Parliament issued an apology to her, and she is now a real heroine down in, um, in Nova Scotia, so much so that they put out a stamp in her honor. And that's something that I find that Canada Post is doing quite a bit to encourage black history, to make people aware of the parts played by blacks. They also before put out a stamp in, front, uh, uh, in memory of John Ware, the cowboy whom I told you about. So that's Viola Desmond's story. Now, in 1971, Mr. Trudeau issued a multicultural policy because he knew that we had to pay more attention, that we have two official languages, we have many different people coming into the country now, so he issued a multicultural policy. Now, in 1984, Mr. Trudeau again appointed Anne Cools to the Senate. Anne Cools is a lady from Barbados, and uh, he made her a senator. And she's got quite a story. Senator Ann Cools was born in Barbados. Her family moved to Montreal when she was 14 years old. She, I think I have a picture of her. Here she is, yes. There's Senator Ann Cools. Um, her family moved to Montreal when she was 14 years old. She attended McGill University. In the 1960s, she became involved in radical campus politics. In 1969, she was a participant in a 10-day sit-in at Sir George Williams University. They have changed that name, so you may have heard, in, in uh, Montreal, we have a university called Concordia. <coughs> and so that's where this sit-in occurred, at Sir George Williams, now Concordia. They were protesting alleged racism at the school. The action ended with $2 million worth of damage having been done to the computers. So although she was not accused of damaging the property herself, Cools was sentenced to four months in prison for participating in the sit-in. And now she did a lot of work for society out in the country. Uh, when I say out in the country, in the country of Canada. In 1974, she founded one of the first women's shelters in Toronto. Now, you know, women's shelters is a place where women can go if they're, if they're being abused by their husbands. 
So she, she was founded one of the first ones. She served on a special joint committee on child custody and excess. She was very vocal in her belief that following a relationship breakdown, shared parenting should be presumed to be in the best interest of the child. You know, very often when there's a marriage breakdown, what happens to the child? The child goes to the mother. Well, this senator said, hey, you know, the, which it's true, most fathers have just as much caring in them for that child as the mother. And so she felt if it's a marriage breakdown, it should be a shared arrangement so that both parents have access to that child more or less on equal footing. <coughs> and so she said shared parenting should be presumed to be in the best interest of the child. In 1984, it was recommended by Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau that she be appointed a senator. She is now the longest serving senator of all the senators in the upper house. In June 2004, she became increased, see, of course, Prime Minister Trudeau was liberal. In 2004, she became increasingly critical of the liberal governments of Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin and of same-sex marriage. She doesn't believe in same-sex marriage. So she crossed the floor and went over to the conservatives. In June 2007, she was removed from the conservative caucus for speaking out against Stephen Harper and for voting against the 2007 budget. So right now, she currently sits as an independent in the House. Now, you know, along the way, we've had some black people appointed. This is Lincoln Alexander. He, I think it was 1984. He was made Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. <coughs> Everyone knows about Nelson Mandela. <coughs> and in 2001, he was made an honorary Canadian citizen. And he is the first living person who, has, who was afforded this honor. And this year, Canada Post put out a stamp in his honor. The Black History stamp this month, this year, yeah, is of Nelson Mandela. Now, we now have a second honorary Canadian citizen who is living, and that is Malala. Malala was made an honorary Canadian citizen. And I think all together we have six honorary Canadian citizens. This is one of the uh, Austin Clark. He's Canada's most widely read black novelist. He won the Giller Prize for book, The Polished O. I think he's now up in his 80s. And of course, we know of Governor General Michel Jeanne. In 2005, Paul Martin announced her appointment. And of course, she's gone on and now. She's um, the Francophonie representative of the United Nations. So she's, she's really moving along and she's from Haiti. Another thing that I, is most interesting is that um, the people of Caribbean heritage started this caravana in Toronto, which is a big like party parade. It now has a new name because caravana was a registered name and so there was some confusion over people not being able to use that name. But people still call it caravana, but that's no longer its official name. Each year, that parade draws over two, two million people to Toronto. And in this celebration of Caravana, it's over a week, sometimes it's, it's different weekends, it pumps $400 million into the Ontario economy. So we see that these differences, this diversity, when we celebrate it and things that we take, they have, they have benefits to our country, do you know? I mean, I know the Chinese have the lovely, um, like your New Year's celebration. And I know we're having one right here in Kingston. Unfortunately, it's on a day that I cannot go. It's on February 21st. Did you guys know that? Of it? It's, yes. it's a celebration there the, for Chinese New Year, yes. right here in Kingston, and it's a nice potluck. <coughs> now, a, a couple of things which I forgot, and I've, as I've got time, I'll go, I'll go back over them.
um, oh, I, I left out three important things. I was telling you, in 1914, that was around the time of World War I. Well, there's an interesting black incident, that of black man trying to enlist for duty in to serve at this war. When Canada was embroiled in brutal battles of the First World War, battlefronts had become gruesome scenes of bloodbaths as Allied soldiers were decimated in violent skirmishes. Canadians were hit hard. Many Canadians were killed in that war. Back home, men of all backgrounds wanted to join in the fight for, for democracy and the right to freedom. Heeding the call, listening to the call to service, and encouraged by an African-Canadian magazine, black men enthusiastically opened the doors of military recruitment offices across Canada. So they had offices where they wanted people to come in and volunteer to fight for Canada. So black men went in and offered to fight, but they were rejected. Were the man too young? Were they too weak? Were they unhealthy? No. It was something that was only visible on the surface, only skin deep. The selection of new soldiers was in the hands of recruitment officers and commanders. The war, those officers declared, was a white man's war. The volunteers were rejected because they were black. They wouldn't even let them fight in the war. <coughs> The reasons given for refusing black, black volunteers, they were absurd, just crazy and repugnant. Sorry, we cannot see our way to accept Negroes as these men would not look good in kilts. Do you know what kilts are? Kilts are what the Scottish people wear, like skirts that men wear. So this was one of the reasons for not accepting black men. They said they wouldn't look good in kilts. I said, give me a break. I've seen some white men who don't look good in kilts. So how does that stand, you know? But anyway, that's the, that's the commander of the 173rd Battalion who said that. We don't want a checkerboard army. Calvin Russ quotes a statement given to the Nova Scotia man. Worse yet, many white men, white soldiers, claimed they would not fight alongside black soldiers. On July 5th, 1916, the first and only Canadian black battalion was officially authorized as a part of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Recruitment for the event took place throughout Canada and Nova Scotia provided the largest group. More than 300 recruits finally went and said were accepted. The number two construction battalion, that was the name of the group that they were in. It sailed for Liverpool, England in March 1917. Among the troops, there were 19 officers and 605 men of other ranks. But they were not permitted to participate in the heavy fighting. They kept them to jobs like hard labor, digging trenches, doing timber work, finding landmines, oh yeah, and preparing roads as the unit had been downgraded to a company, so they weren't allowed to take part. Now, decades later, the Canadian government made amends for the racial discrimination suffered by black volunteers during World War I. Since the early 1990s, the men of number two construction battalion have been uh, celebrated down in Pictou, Nova Scotia, and they've got a nice polished stone monument, which I've never seen which were unveiled in 1993. But there was one man, one black man, who got to do a bit more. His name was Private Jeremiah Jones, and he played a major role in the battle at Vimy Ridge. He single-handedly threw a grenade, which cleared out a German dugout and captured the survivors and their machine gun. So he was awarded the medallion for distinguished service after he died. And his grandson accepted it for him. 
Now, most of this story I got from an article written by a lady who lives up in, in here in Kingston, named Sus Susanna McLeod. I, I saw this article in the newspaper, so I had to save it because it was something I hadn't heard about. So I contacted her and asked her about her research, and she said, oh, it took a lot of time digging through the library and going through, back in those days where they didn't have that much on computers, what they call microfiche. I think it was from computers, but she did a lot of digging, and this is how she came up with this story. <coughs> there are many more stories of discrimination of, uh, against blacks, but time does not permit. Among the more interesting is how the immigration of Canada, they set up roadblocks, and they, they admitted over the years that, that they did set it up against different people, different cultures coming into the country. Then, over the years, they changed it, and then they put in a point system, and on and on. Now, another in interesting thing that happened around, um, from this same First World War. After the First World War, around 1918, many of the soldiers were returning home. And they, like I said, they were decimated, so they had serious injuries. So much so, so many were injured, that they had to set up a, a hospital in Grant Hall at Queen's University. That Grant Hall was made a temporary hospital. And many of the soldiers returning from war were placed there. So of course they had to have medical care. So some of the people who looked after them were fourth and fifth year MAD students. They were at Queen's and it's a five year program, I guess but they were in their fourth year and some were in their fifth year. So there were some, back in these days, they were called Negroes. Negroes means the black people. So some of these black doctors were looking after these soldiers. Well, the soldiers complained. They said, we don't want black Negroes looking after us. So the university had to say, well, what are we gonna do about this? And so they consulted with the university, with McGill University, and with the University of Toronto. And they found that those universities were experiencing the same problems. These white soldiers did not want Negroes looking after them. So the university, what, what do we do? These kids have spent all this money. They're in their fourth year and fifth year. This kids in fifth years got one finishing off this year and then they'll be certified, I guess the university expelled them. They expelled them. They hadn't done anything wrong, but these whites did not want them looking after them. And the university told them, maybe you need to go to Dalhousie. Dalhousie has more of a black population. So that was very discriminatory. They told them, go to that black, <laughs> go to that um, Dalhousie, because there are more black people down in that area. You remember, many of the blacks went to Nova Scotia. And um, what I found interesting, the person who told that story, they've even got on the thing um, the notes from the Senate. So you can read the Senate notes, and it's right there in black and white. So I found that very, very disheartening. Um, Oh, I know what else I wanted to tell you. Um, you know, down in Nova Scotia, as I told you, many blacks went down there. Well, quite a story down there is this place called Africville. Now, last year, Canada Post, and I meant to bring it this morning, but I forgot, Canada Post um, stamp celebrated, or was in honor of, I don't know if you want to celebrate this place, Africville and Hogan's Alley. Hogan's Alley was a black, um, community over in Vancouver, and <coughs> Africville is down in Nova Scotia. Now, I wrote a bit about this Africville because I was just, I just found it appalling. Africville was a small community located on the shore of Bedford Basin in Halifax, Nova Scotia. During the 20th century, the city of Halifax began to encroach on the southern shores of Bedford Basin, and the community was eventually included as part of the city through municipal amalgamation. That means they weren't officially a part of the city until later. 
but then they amalgamated and became part. Africville was populated almost entirely by black Nova Scotians. The city neglected the community throughout the 20th century until it deteriorated to extreme conditions. The community and its dwellings were ordered destroyed and residents evicted during the late, as late as 1960s, in advance of the opening of the nearby Murray Mackay Bridge. It was settled after the War of 1812. It all began with a promise to black loyalists and War of 1812 refugees of free land and equal rights. That's what they promised them. It was crucial in its, in its start was the building of a Baptist church. Church was the center of life in Africville, and on that step, you will see that church, because many of the black people were quite religious, and much of their social life um, centered around the church and activities in the church. So they built this Baptist church, and actually, in my other, um, I read that one of the Baptist ministers there, he was so charismatic that blacks and whites went to his church to hear his sermons. I mean, if you ever get a chance to go visit in one of the islands and you go to one of those Baptist churches, when I go home to visit, boy, you go to that church, you know you're in a church. <laughs> the people get very, very involved and they will, when they feel the spirit move in them, they will shout out. Some will raise hands and they will sing out and boy, and the music, the music is really incredible. It's something. When I go home, I, I go to church here, United Church, but when I go back to my home country, Bermuda, I have to get to that church. It's just so important to me, and, and uh, I like the spirit that I feel there. So the church was the center of life in Africville. It, it began as a small and poor but self-sufficient rural community of about 50 people in the 19th century. But there was an influx in the population after and during World War I, and it led to the community becoming overcrowded. In the late 1850s, the Nova Scotia Railway was built, and it went right through the middle of Africville. Jobs were scarce, and racism made life difficult. No good jobs for blacks. Education was lacking. It wasn't until 1883 that we got the first elementary school, but no funding. Up until 1933, none of the teachers had formal training. So just somebody who felt interest in the children and others would do the teaching. The town never received proper roads, health services, water, street lamps, or electricity. Lack of these services had, had serious health implications. Contamination of the wells was a serious and ongoing issue. That means you, you couldn't even count on the water from the wells being all that safe. And so people would use the water from the wells, but they realized they had to boil it before really using it. <clears throat> so yeah, the little water they re received. As the city of Hal Halifax expanded, Africville became a preferred site for all types of undesirable industries and facilities. So they sent a prison there in 1853. They did an infectious disease hospital in 1870. Then they put a slaughterhouse there. You know, that's where they kill all the animals. And even a depository for fecal waste from nearby Russellville. So all the stuff from the toilets, they sent it there to Effortville. So you can see how this place was just run down and anything bad that they could think of, they sent it to Effortville. In 1958, the city decided to move the town garbage dump to Effortville. While the residents knew they could not legally fight this, they illegally salvaged the dump. They went through the dump for usable goods, and they found clothes there sometimes, copper, steel, brass, tin. So they made the best of a bad situation. Now it's officially labeled a slum. 
So finally, between 1964 and 1967, a relocation took place. It took that long because some people just stayed there and said, we're not going to move. So at least they didn't shove them out. Um, the residents were assisted in their move, and when they moved them out, they used dump trucks. Can you imagine? They're going to move you out, so they put you on a garbage truck? This is how those people were treated, as late as 1967. This image forever stuck in the minds and hearts of people, and clearly indicated, indicated the degrading style in which these people were treated before, during, and after the move. Now, in May 2005, a bill was introduced in Parliament by the NDP, uh, that's the New Democratic Party of Nova Scotia, calling for a formal apology. On February 23rd, 2010, they called for the apology in 2005. Finally, in 2010, five years later, they get an apology. Um, Halifax Council ratified a proposal for an Africville apology with an arrangement with the Government of Canada to establish a $250,000 Africville Heritage Trust to design a museum and build a replica of the community church. On February 24, 2010, Halifax Mayor Peter, Peter Kelly made the Africville apology, apologizing for the evictions as part of a $4.5 million compensation deal. And as I told you before, last year's Black History Stamp featured Africville and Hogan's Alley. Um, now, you know, you see people, black people, uh, as I showed you, Lincoln Alexander, Ann Cools, Michelle Jean, they, they, they've honored black people. But what I find, and what is the truth, I can tell you, those are tokens to us black people. Because when you see these things being done for the blacks, what have we gained out of it? Oh yes, we can say we've had a black governor general, we can say we've had a black lieutenant governor, but what has trickled down to the mainstream? There's still a lot of discrimination. So what we have to keep pushing for is for diversity. Because you know, the way that people do things becomes the accepted way to do it. And unless we make people aware of the value of diversity, things just will not change. You know, I found myself, which really shocked me. I'm a person who's always speaking out for diversity, but you know, things are always done a certain way in countries. I have lived in Canada so long, and mainly here in Kingston, that I find I have fallen into a certain pattern. What shocked me was, and, and I'm always speaking out anti-racism, I, I actually, um, was a director in the Federation of Women Teachers of Ontario. So I had to go, well, I was assigned to a certain area because I live in Ontario East. This was my area. And I had to go around and speak to teachers and tell them about things that were happening that were racist. They weren't doing it on purpose, but racism is, we call this systemic racism. It becomes a part of you, and so you're doing it and you don't even realize you're doing it. So my job was to make people aware of what they were doing that, that were racist practices. And many of the teachers accepted it, and you know, they'd say to me, Judy, tell me, tell me, tell me if I'm doing something, because they really didn't want to be doing it. But anyway, the incident that I said really shook me up was I visited my home country, Bermuda. This was just two summers ago, and my daughter-in-law had a problem I forget what it is. Anyway, it can get to your eyes, and it can, it can harm your eyes. So my daughter-in-law, who lives in Canada too, was visiting. So we said, well, we better take you to the doctor to make sure everything's okay, because her eyes were itching her, and so we took her. And then I'm sitting there with her, waiting for the doctor, the ophthalmologist, to come up. <laughs> out comes the ophthalmologist, and it's a black woman. I was shocked. <laughs> I mean, I didn't tell anyone. But I felt it in myself, and I said, oh my God, I have been so conditioned.
by this country. I was expecting the doctor to be a white person, could have been a man or a woman. And I was shocked when it was, a, and I said, oh my goodness. So what it, what it pointed out to me, the importance of mentoring and, and getting up there and letting people see who you are and doing certain things. Another incident is when we took our kids to Bermuda and my daughter was four years old and she went to church with my aunt. And when she came home to her dad and I, we didn't go because she went to Sunday school, that's for little kids. So the first thing she said to me, four years old, and she said, Mom, everyone there was black. She said, even the teacher was black. Her dad and I are teachers, but she did not see us as teachers. She sees us as mommy and daddy. And you know, I found that quite revealing that she had to go there and see that. So I felt that trip was worth it because it gives them the idea, you know, you can be anything you want to be. So it's very important to get those images out there. And you know, when you see images that aren't good images, I speak up about them. Like one image, when I get my chance, I want to speak to the city about. And that is, I went to a meeting there and they unfolded this big poster of the city of Kingston, and it had a group of people on it. I did not see one black person there. You know, we must be in those images to keep it before people. I don't know if I saw any Muslims, but I look for images like that. And you know, it's not that I'm paranoid or it's not that I'm carried away. The reason I look for that is because I was an anti-racist teacher and I had to go about, so therefore, when I look at images, I'm conscious of them. Because this is what I was t I'm telling teachers. When you use images in your class, you must use different cultures to make people feel connected and feel apart. So out of this, I think when you, when you get a chance and you see that something do doesn't include you, I think you need to speak up about it and say, look, I'd like to see myself there. But that's the end of my story, ladies and gents. If you have any questions or any comments, hope I didn't keep it too long and tire you out. Well, you guys were most attentive. I really enjoyed talking with you. And um, that is very nice.